Uh, we're continuing our series called That's a Great Question. One, one uh, announcement. Um, I'm going to go old school. We're going to try something. It's going to bring back some memories for some of you who went to a church where the pastor at the end stood in the back and shook every hand of everyone who left. Anybody went to that church growing up? Okay, we're not going to do that, but uh, we're going to do something similar. I'm going to go out uh, to the Welcome Center with Candy uh, and really just meet people who are new to Long Hollow. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this and uh, I just said, you know, we got to do something about it. Or Pastor Robbie's too busy to meet me. Or I've been going here a long time and he didn't have time to see me. And that's simply not the case. And so I want to go out there at the Welcome Center and you can just stop by and we'll wait. I think last service we had. Now, this is not to answer theological questions about the sermon, by the way, okay? You can email those in. I will answer those. Uh, this is not to say every week, you know, inside. Th those things are good. But this is for people who are new or just coming along. Maybe you've been here a couple of years, you just haven't gotten to meet us, we would love to meet you after the service uh, at the Welcome Center. Uh, the, the sermon uh, series is called, That's a Great Question. And this question has come in in many different forms. And I really think it's a question that a lot of people want to know about. And here's how the question was phrased. Is it right or wrong for a Christian to drink alcohol? And uh, you know, if, you, if you've looked around, drinking is a part of the culture we live in today. In fact, uh, many people would say baseball is America's pastime. And growing up in New Orleans, I would say drinking was ours, right? I mean, everybody in New Orleans drank. And the longer I've been in Tennessee, now about 15, 16 years, I realize that it seems to be the same with Middle Tennessee, right? I mean, everybody uh, around here is infiltrated with drinking and alcohol. Alcohol is a pretty hot topic uh, just for the uh, reference in pastors I talk to, with Christians I meet with, everybody wants to know about drinking. Now, it's hard to miss drinking in the Bible, particularly wine. Uh, wine is all through the Old Testament. Uh, you see wine in the New Testament as well. And the way you look at drinking kind of bifurcates you or divides you on one of two sides. On one side, you may use drinking as a litmus test to determine someone's spirituality. You may judge someone and say, oh, look, they drink and so they live this way. On the other hand, you look at someone who doesn't drink or abstains from drinking as being old fashioned or maybe legalistic in their faith. And so it's important for us to figure out what the Bible actually says about drinking. The Old Testament talks about it, obviously wines throughout the Old Testament. The New Testament has passages about it. In fact, in the New Testament, you realize that Jesus begins his ministry at a with a miracle at a wedding when he turns wine into Welch's, right? <laughs> That's not the case. He actually turns water into wine, right? I mean, water is into actual wine. At the Last Supper, Jesus is gonna distribute a cup with wine in it. And then he's gonna say, this is my blood, which is given for you. Uh, Paul even tells Timothy in his final letter, drink a little wine for your stomach. And so the question you've asked is, is it right or wrong to drink alcohol? Which is a good question. But I wanna offer a better question. And the better question is this, is it wise for a Christian to drink alcohol? Now, let me just begin by telling you personally, if you know my story, uh, I have struggled through the years with alcohol and drug abuse. Uh, I grew up in South Louisiana, right outside of New Orleans, where we had a saying growing up called laissez le bon temps rouler, which meant let the good times roll. And it seemed like the good times always rolled better with alcohol. And I started drinking at the age of 16 years old, uh, after every basketball game, I'd go out to drink with guys at the bar. Every party had alcohol at it. Uh, drinking was just a part of the culture of my life. Fast forward, you know the story. After two rehab treatments, many bad decisions, and blowing thousands of dollars to drug and alcohol-related abuse, I decided to give up drink, drinking alcohol once and for all. By God's grace, last Monday, May 1st, I haven't drank alcohol in 20 years. I haven't drank a sip, yeah, a sip of alcohol in 20 years. Now, I wanna just say, just to frame that, my giving up of alcohol was based on my personal experience. It was shortly thereafter that I said, I need to figure out what the Bible says about this because I wanna figure out what God's word says about alcohol and drinking. And so that's what we're gonna do today. And let me just say right out the gate, I have no ax to grind here, okay? Just want you to hear me. 
I'm not trying to convince you to come over to my side or convince you to think a different way. I wanna simply present what the Bible says. I wanna offer some consequences because of drinking, and I wanna let you come to your own conviction. Because at the end of the day, when you stand before the Lord of how you live your life, I'm not gonna stand next to you to give an account. You are. And so you have to understand. And that's why we say at Long Hollow, when I preach any message, I want you to go figure it out for yourself. If someone says to you, you need to believe what I say and don't search anywhere else, you need to leave that place immediately because that's a cult. So study the Bible, figure out what you said. Don't just take my word for it. Okay, so the first question, we're gonna start, two big questions. Number one is, what does the Bible say about alcohol? What does the Bible say about alcohol? If you're taking notes, there'll be three sub points for every two points. Don't have three points, a poem, and an application point, but we do have two points and three points. So, very confusing. Okay, number one, what does the Bible say about alcohol? Letter A, drinking is not a sin, okay? Let me just say it right out the gate. There is no way you can make a case from the Bible to show that drinking is a sin. Obviously, if you read the Bible, alcohol is seen predominantly throughout the scripture in the form of wine. Uh, wine was used in the Old Testament at the Shabbat or the Sabbath ceremony every Friday. They drank wine at the festivals and the feast days. Uh, they drank wine at weddings. It was a part of the culture. There are actually a few cases where you don't see just wine, you see something called strong drink. The CSB translates it interesting as beer. Interestingly, it's beer, which is fascinating. But I wanna make this case right out the gate. There is a significant difference today between the distillation process of hard liquors like vodka, whiskey, and bourbon, and the wine of Jesus' day. And that's gonna be a big point I'm gonna drive home in a moment. You gotta understand, for the record, I just wanna get us on the same page. You never find anybody in the Bible taking shots. <laughs> right? it's, not, it's not in there, right? You won't find anybody shooting shots. On the other extreme, you can't make the case that drinking wine is a sin. So let me just say, drinking itself is not a sin. Number two, drunkenness is. The Bible is very clear, drunkenness is a sin. Now I could give you a couple passages, but I'm gonna start with this one. Galatians chapter five, verse 19, if you have a Bible. This will be the first of a few passages we'll look at. Verse 19, Paul is talking to the church of Galatia and he's basically telling them, the works of the flesh, which is the former way you used to live compared to the works of the spirit. He's always contrasting these two ways to live. The works of the flesh are obvious, you can see them. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, and what? Drunkenness carousing, and anything similar. I'm warning you about these things as I have warned you before, that those who, here's the word, practice, that's key, such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice what he's not saying. Paul's not talking about messing up. Paul's not talking about losing your temper. Paul's not talking about getting drunk from time to time. What he's saying is, this is the pattern of someone's life. This is the guy that has to drink a cold Bud Light every day leaving work. This is the person who gets a six pack every Friday night. This is the friend who has to go clubbing every Friday, Saturday night and, and drink alcohol. What he's saying is this is the pattern of someone's life. Now, another passage to study, if you're interested, is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 and 10. Very similar idea from Paul. So the first thing, let's just kind of set the record. Dr drinking alcohol is not a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. And here's a big one. Number three, wine was safer than water in the first century. Why? Yeah, that's what I thought too when I was studying this. <laughs> wine was safer than water in the first century. Now let me just, and, you, and Lynn, all this stuff you can, Search online yourself if you're interested. In the ancient days, stored water in containers accumulated something called bacteria. Now, they didn't have the technology like we have today through a microscope to look at the bacteria forming. They just knew if they drank out of water that was stored for a particular period of time, they would get really sick. 
And so what they realized was that drinking, quote, watered wine was safer than drinking water. Here's the dilemma they had. When you drank wine, you risked drunkenness. When you drank water, you risked death. Pretty simple wager here, right? And so what they realized was if they watered down the wine, it was better for their stomach. It was better for their body, which is why Paul tells Timothy, hey, you got a problem with the water in the town, so drink a little wine for your stomach. Now, I wanna make this case so you understand. The alcohol content back then is not even close to the alcohol content today. I learned this many years ago when I was in New Testament class with my Greek professor who today is one of the foremost New Testament theologians around uh, in, in Christendom. His name is Dr. Chuck Quarles. And uh, I took him for Greek. His nickname I gave him was the hammer. Because Greek was hard, but he was even harder, right? So we call him the, he didn't like that name. But anyway, the hammer uh, knew his Old Testament, it was New Testament, Old Testament theology. And basically he taught us this about the culture. Notice what Dr. Coral says. He says, a careful study of the Mishnah and Talmuds. Now, what this shows us is these two books, if you ever listen to our podcast or study the Jewishness of Jesus, these two books are actually respected books in the Jewish culture on the Old Testament. So what that means is you, go, you can go find this online and study this yourself. A careful study of the Mishnah and Talmud shows that the normal dilution rate among the Jews was three parts water to one part wine. This dilution rate reduces the alcohol content of the New Testament wine to 2.75 to 3% by volume. I wanna give you a chart to show you how relevant that is today. We're gonna to start with the, with the big boy, the whiskey, 80 proof, and then we'll work our way down. And if you notice, I got something for everybody. I got cold 45 for the old bucks. I got, I got white claw for the young whippersnappers in here, right? And I got a light beers for those counting calories, right? Show of hands, how many people have drank what? No, I'm playing. <laughs> you ain't fooling me, I've been there. I've done that, right? I know, I know. And I got wine for the ladies, right? They're Marcella wine. But here's the point, I wanna show you because we don't realize the difference. Whiskey at 80 proof, Alcoholic content is 40% by volume, which is 13.3 times more potent than the wine of Jesus' day. Marsala wine, 18% by volume, six times more potent than the wine of Jesus' day. Cold 45, 6% volume, two times more potent than Jesus' day. 5%, 66% more potent. Light beers, even the light beer, 4.2% is 40% more potent. Chuck Quarles is gonna give us an explanation of this. He says, 80 proof whiskey has an alcohol content, mind blowing, that is 1,330% more potent than biblical wine. To argue that approval of drinking New Testament wine in moderation implies approval of drinking whiskey in a similar quantity is like arguing, get this, that if a physician prescribes two extra strength Tylenol, caplets every six hours for a headache, then it's okay to take 26 caplets instead. <laughs> Most of us know better than that. Consuming 13 times the approved amount of the medication could prove to be fatal. Now, I know what you're thinking, but pastor, didn't Jesus turn water into the best wine? Right? Because that was one of the questions. And the answer is yes, he did. The Bible says he turned water into the best wine, but don't miss this. Best does not mean necessarily potency as much as it means quality. I want you to get this. Jesus turning the water into wine shows the best wine, shows the audience in us, and this is one of the meanings of the miracle, that it takes a long time to produce the best wine because of the fermentation process. And I wanna to submit to you, if you've never thought about it, that the miracle that Jesus performs is as much about Jesus being Lord over time, because it takes time to produce wine, and Jesus being Lord of time can in a moment produce the best wine as much as it is Jesus miraculously saving a wedding festival. 
Again, another sermon for another day, but I wanna show you this is what happens with the wine. So number two, so we have drinking is not a sin. Drunkenness is a sin. Number three, wine was safer than water. I wanna shift gears and I wanna give you some practical results of what happens from drinking alcohol. The second part, we'll talk about what is the result of excessive drinking of alcohol. And there's three points again. The first one is this, drinking alcohol, according to scripture, can lead to reckless living. Listen to me, drinking alcohol can lead to reckless living. Drinking is not a sin, obviously, but drunkenness, I know from firsthand experience, can lead to destruction. Can anybody testify to that? To destruction. Ephesians chapter five, we'll camp out here for a moment. Paul is going to talk about in verses 15 through 18, this idea of walking. Now, the passage that we use for drunkenness is verse 18. But in many cases, many of you do not know the context of this passage because we lift it out of the context and apply it. So here's what I wanna do. I wanna put it back into his context to show you Paul's argument, okay? Notice what he says, verse 15. Pay careful attention then to how you walk. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So what he's saying is, be careful how you walk. In, in essence, here's what he's saying. Be careful how you live. Pay very close attention to things in your life that could cause you to go astray. Let me ask you a question. How many people in here have a big dog or a medium-sized dog in a small backyard? Anybody? Anybody have two dogs in a small backyard? Anybody bold enough or crazy enough like us at one time to have three dogs in a backyard? Anybody? Do you ever walk at night in the dark barefoot? <laughs> Some of you get that later. Never, why? Because you may step on something you will regret, right? So if you won't walk in the dark in the backyard in a grass, grassy area because of dogs, then what he's saying is don't you dare walk in this world as unwise people not taking account of how you're living. That's what he's saying. This is how I got the idea for the sermon. Paul says, don't live as an unwise man, but live as a wise person, which is why the question is, is it wise for a Christian to drink? What he says is, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, here's the passage. And don't get drunk with what? Wine or alcohol, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit of God. So what he's saying is, watch how you're living to make sure you don't stumble into something that's gonna cause harm. Why? Because the days are evil. Now, watch what Paul's doing here. Paul gives in verse 18, you can write in the margin, he gives what's called a causal statement. It's a, it's a, if this happens, then this happens. Meaning, if you get drunk, then this happens. Now, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put on this screen a line and I want you to fill in the blank. Here's the line. Don't get drunk, which leads to blank. Don't say it out loud, by the way. Some of the other service were eager to respond out loud. We, we know the answer, but I want you to think of the answer. Think of the answer. Don't get, just think of the answer. What would you fill in the blank? This is the test in school for you young people. Don't get drunk, which leads to blank. What are you thinking about? Better yet, who are you thinking about? Maybe this person comes to mind. Or, or th think of a, a situation maybe you're thinking about. Can you think of a time when drinking led you to do something you regretted? I know I can. See, the reality is this. When you get drunk, you give yourself over to what the Bible says, reckless living. In essence, here's what you do for those who've never drank before. You say things you regret. You do things you hate. You engage in conversations, activities, young ladies, relationships that you wouldn't in a million years engage in if you were otherwise sober. What happens is you let your guard down and you basically give in to things you normally would. Now, here's what Paul's saying. That's not Paul's argument. Paul's argument is this. There's only one thing that can control you at one time. Watch this. 
You're either going to be full of the Spirit or you're gonna be consumed with spirits. Spirit, that's why they call it spirits, I think, by the way. No, I made that up. But anyway, but think about it. Alcohol is called spirits. Full of the spirits or full of the spirit, but you can't be filled with both. Now, here's a logical way to think about this. Have you ever thought about this? How can a person, or, or better yet, how do you know a person is full of the spirit? How do you diagnose yourself? I'm full of the spirit. Like that brother, is he walking around like a puppet? You're like, wow, that guy has the spirit. No, it's not how it works. It's not a puppet show. Here's the thing. You're full of the spirit when the spirit consumes your mind. Better yet, when the spirit controls your conscience. That's what Paul said, do not be transformed by the ways of the world, be filled by the, or be changed by the renewal of your mind. For those who have drank or gotten drunk before, what is the first thing to go by the wayside when you're drunk? The mind, the conscience, the ability to push back and to say no. So here's the point, Paul's making it. You cannot be full of the spirit and drunk at the same time. You can't be full of the spirit and full of spirits at the same time, drink. You can't be full of the spirit and buzzed at the same time which leads to another question we got. Is being buzzed drunk? Because I don't drink to get drunk, I just drink to get a buzz. Anybody ever heard that before? And the problem is, I mean, honestly, when I used to drink, the problem was I never knew the line between buzzed and drunk. But I promise you, these two brothers here in the front row, the sheriff's department knows the difference. I promise you that, amen? The sheriff's department will tell you the difference. And they'll tell you both of them are drunk, right? It's drunk. And here's the problem. The reason you can't stop drinking before you get drunk is because alcohol reduces your ability to determine the present condition that you're in. Like you have no ability to discern where you are in the moment. Why? Because your willpower to stop drinking is hindered. In addition to that, you have no way to stop. And so basically you fall into this downward spiral. Don't take my word for it. The great philosopher Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> said it this way. People don't drink because they enjoy, enjoy to drink. They drink to change. Most drink to get buzzed. And I would submit to you today Buzzed drinking is drunkenness. Now, I wanna to appeal to you from a physical standpoint because the reality is that's like present situations in your life. But according to the CDC, we have a much bigger issue. According to the CDC, every day, 380 people die from alcohol-related deaths. 380 people. For example's sake, it would be like boarding uh, or filling up a 747 jet airplane filled with passengers. Every day it takes off from the landing strip, goes into the air and crashes down, killing everyone aboard. The next day, same thing. Filled to the brim, 747 takes off and crashes. Next day, takes off and crashes. What it shows us is that alcohol is the third preventable death in America. 144,000 people die every single day related to alcohol deaths. And here's what a whopping statistic, I had to go back and check it because I couldn't believe it. Excessive drinking shortens the person's life on average by 26 years. Excessive drinking will shorten a person's life by 26 years. But Robbie, Drinking's legal. I'm 21 years old. What are you talking about? I can drink. I'm legal. That's true if you're over 21. But listen to me, young people. Even if something is legal, it doesn't make it right. Listen, marijuana is about to be legal in all 50 states. It is. But it doesn't mean it's wise to get stoned before going to work. Okay? And if you don't believe me, ask your boss. He does not want you stoned 
high on ganja at the office. I promise you, he does not want that, right? And neither does your, your, your parents or your, or your spouse. Um, you think about this, in Nevada, prostitution is legal, but it's not right. Gambling is legal uh, around the country, but it doesn't mean it's right, right? Cheering for Florida is legal. <laughs> But it doesn't make it right in Tennessee. I'm just saying, it does, it's not right. There's certain things that aren't right, right? Now, I tell, you, I tell you this to show you all this. If anyone has a PhD in stupidity when it comes to drinking, it's me. I mean, I was thinking back to the years I used to get drunk. There was never a time for those who used, who used to get drunk or even still get drunk, there's never a time in my life when I woke up the next morning and said, wow, I'm so glad I was loaded last night. I made the best decision of my life. I'm so glad I did. Have you ever did that before? I have said the opposite. I have woken up the next morning and said, wow, I just made the dumbest decision of my life. I woke up and said, man, I regret what I just did. I wish I wouldn't have said that. Friends, I would submit to you that most of the dumbest decisions of your life were made in connection to alcohol. Anybody with me? Most of the dumbest decisions, which leads to number two. Not only does alcohol bring consequences for us, number two, drinking can cause other people around us to stumble. Your drinking can cause other people to stumble. Now, Paul is gonna teach the church of Rome about eating and drinking, and drinking particularly drinking wine, and he basically says you need to consider that your decisions have an effect on other people. Because I used to say, you don't understand, what I'm doing in my home doesn't affect anybody. You ever said that? Well, Paul's gonna appeal to you. Paul says in Romans 14, 15, for if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, and you can even put drink in there, you are no longer walking according to love. Here's what he's saying. The idea that I'm living my life, I don't care about anyone else. You cannot say that as a Christian because now you've been bought with a price. Your life is not your own. You have an obligation to love your neighbor as yourself, as a Christian. And so what he's saying is, if it causes someone to stumble, you're not walking according to love. Do not destroy by what you eat or drink someone for whom Christ died. Verse 21. It is a good thing not to eat meat or drink what? Wine or drink alcohol or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and the Lord. So the idea that you say, hey, I don't hurt anybody. I just have a glass of wine at dinner in my own home and it doesn't affect anybody outside the home. That may be true, but let me remind you about my own life. My first drink of alcohol was in my home. In New Orleans, it was very uh, commonplace for parents to have liquor closets or liquor cabinets, and my family had a liquor closet, and I took a drink of alcohol in the home, and years later, I would drink alcohol. When I drank the bottle, I'd fill it up with water and put it back. I thought I was slick, and I'll never forget the day my mom found all of those bottles filled with water, and it crushed her. Friends, the, look at me, the primary place that your children and my children will experiment with alcohol will be in the home. And no matter how responsible we are and no matter how we try to protect it, we are increasing their chances of drinking by having alcohol in the home. And here's the problem. The problem is not that alcohol stays in the home. If it starts in the home, it doesn't end in the home. Let me remind you of a, of a, of a parental insight. What you minimize in your home your children will maximize outside of it. What you minimize and all, meaning if you just have a beer on the weekends, they're gonna say, dad drinks a beer, I can drink a six pack. If you cheat in the home or lie in the home or fudge in the home or you're dishonest in the home in just small ways, they're gonna maximize that as a license for liberty outside of the home. Here's another way to say it. Children embrace what their parents tolerate. Children embrace what a parent tolerates. Now, why are you beating this drum, Robbie? Here's why. Statistically, not me, statistically, a child that drinks as a teenager is eight times more likely to do drugs later. Write that down. A child that drinks alcohol as a teenager is eight times more likely to do drugs 
later. As my friend Chris Swain used to say, alcohol never put families back together, but it has torn many families apart. Which leads to the final one, and this is the one I think could affect some people in here in a personal way. Drinking alcohol normally masks a deeper problem. I know it did for me. Drinking alcohol normally masks a deeper problem. I can give you a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about alcohol and masking our feelings. In fact, by the way, I, I had these in here, but I felt like it was a little too much. There are 75 different warnings against alcohol in the Bible. Did you know that? 75 different warnings against the effects and consequences of alcohol. Here's one about feelings being masked with alcohol. Proverbs 31, we don't think of it as a passage for alcohol. Think, about, think of it as a passage for women, the model woman, Proverbs 31 woman. But Solomon begins the passage this way. Verse six, give beer or strong drink to one who is dying and wine to one whose life is bitter. Why? So they don't think about life. Just drown out the sorrow. Let the person, let him drink so that he can forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. I, I wanna be clear with you. I want you to look at me for a moment. Alcohol is a drug. Now, I know that's gonna hit some of you differently. You're like, I don't know if I agree with that. Don't take my word for it. Alcohol is a drug. It's a product that carries a warning in the form of a label. Uh, if you study any, anybody in, in this field, Mar Mar Marvin Block is one of the big ones. Uh, he is the former chairman of the Amer American Medical Association of Alcoholism. Marvin Block said this. He said, our society is a drug-oriented society largely because of alcohol. Because of alcohol's social acceptance, alcohol is rarely thought of as a drug, but a drug it is in scientific fact. You know, I remember years ago when I started drinking excessively. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was trying to cope and mask a deeper problem of depression that I didn't know I had. I'd had a business that had fallen apart. I had a relationship that had gone by the wayside. I didn't have any hope or future. I had a friend who had just passed away from a drug addiction even before my addiction. And my whole world turned upside down. Drowning my sorrows seemed easier at the time than to face them. And I thought the solution to my problem was to be found at the end of an empty beer bottle. The end of an empty pill bottle. And I'm here to tell you it wasn't. Look at me, for some of you, drinking has become a coping mechanism in your life to forget your problems momentarily, sadly, only to wake up later to find out they're still there. See, it's easier to dull the pain in the present with alcohol because it seems simpler, but the problem is they will arise later in life. Here's a, here's a principle of, of counseling I wanna share with you. And I learned this with my own grief and dealing with issues in my own life. You have to feel to heal. Think about this. To heal, you have to feel. And what alcohol does is it dulls your feelings so you never experience healing. You have to feel to heal. Now, with any sin or issue in our life, we know that freedom is not found in an empty beer bottle, at the end of a pill bottle. It's not found in any other place than the person of Jesus Christ, right? Friends, you have to understand, the reason I went to rehab twice is because I tried to do it without Christ, which is why I tell people, sobriety, look at me, sobriety without Jesus is always a dead-end street. And maybe the reason you haven't experienced freedom in your life, put alcohol aside, fill in the blank, addiction, pornography, sin, pride, Anger, I don't know what it is controls you. Uh, and eating, something in your life. The reason you've been consumed by this is maybe because you haven't fully asked Jesus into your life and surrendered your life to him to set you free once and for all from something you're trying to do in your own strength. I'm here to tell you what you're looking for in life is found in Jesus, and I know it was for me. So to go back to the question we started with, and here's the question, is it wise for a Christian to drink? And the answer is, according to Paul, listen to me, in many situations and circumstances, in different stages of life, it's not. 
In many settings today where alcohol is consumed, it's not the, the use of alcohol that's the problem, it's the abuse of alcohol, right? Like the parties you are getting invited to or the bars you're going to or the honky-tonk places you attend or even the weddings we attend today, right? They are not pushing restraint and uh, being inside uh, uh, control. No, it's always about over-drinking, indulging, pushing the limits, reducing our inhibitions. And I'm here to tell you, that is not the behavior of a man or a woman who is living a Christian life for God. I'm just here to tell you, it's not. Now, listen to me. Is it a sin to enjoy a glass of wine over dinner? No, the Bible doesn't say that. Is it a sin to enjoy a craft beer around a campfire with a bunch of guys talking about life? For you, it may not be. However, listen to me. There are principles or rules you have to follow before you get there. And I wanna give you a few of them. Here's the first one. Listen to me. If you have a propensity for alcohol or substance abuse or a family history of substance abuse, meaning if your dad has an addiction problem, if your mom or her family or his family or your grandfather or your grandmother or your uncles, if there is a propensity to addictions or substance abuse, it is highly unwise for you to drink alcohol. It's not a good idea. Number two, if drinking in the home is setting a standard for your kids, to abuse alcohol later, and you say, yes, it is, then it is unwise for you to drink alcohol. If your drinking is tempting someone in your life who has set a barrier of protection because of past abuse, then the answer is it's unwise for you to drink alcohol. For those of you under age, it is a sin for you to drink alcohol. So that's an easy one. If you're under age, it's a sin to drink alcohol. Now, why is alcohol such a problem? Follow me. Drinking alcohol is like playing Russian roulette with a gun of addiction. What do you mean? The only way you know you have a problem with drinking is when you have a problem, and at that point, it's a problem. That's the only way you find out. See, alcohol is deceiving. And you don't know that you have a problem with alcohol until you figure it out, it's a problem. And by that point, you have to go to rehab to experience sobriety. And so as a Christian, as Candy always says, and this is a great line, she, she says, she says, you know, as a Christian, we don't have many ways that we can live different from the world. Listen to me, young people. There's not many ways we can live different. So many ways people can look at you and say, man, he's different or she's different. Obviously in our speech, the way we talk, but one of the ways we can live different is in our actions. And by abstaining from alcohol, that is one of the ways you can live differently from a culture that is going this direction. And if you don't believe it, I'll show you. Chris Williamson, who is a fitness coach, and I don't think he's a recovering alcoholic or addict. I think he simply stopped drinking because of the effects of alcohol on the body. By the way, uh, um, Alan, uh, what's his name, Huberman, What's Huberman's first name? Can't think of it. He's, a, he's a doctor, a scientist. I think it's Alan, Alan Huberman. Huberman is a scientist who basically talks about all the effects of the brain. It's a friend of his. Here's what he says. Alcohol is the only, this is a great line. Alcohol is the only drug where if you don't do it, people assume you have a problem. Let me say that again. If you don't believe me, go to a party and try it. Go to a party. Alcohol is the only drug where if you don't do it, people around you assume you have a problem. I wanna to speak to the young adults in here for a moment. Young people, young adults. If you're of age and you can drink or about to be, the reality is in life that in almost every situation where you're encouraged to drink by other people, it's probably the worst situation to drink. When people are encouraging you to drink, it's normally the worst situation, why? Because the parties you go to will not encourage restraint. Bars themselves don't lend themselves to self-control. The tasting tour in Naples is not designed with your holiness in mind, okay? You just need to know that. The, the spring break tour is not gonna turn out for your good in the area of walking with God. In almost every situation, unless you're training to be a sommelier, which is, 
So he's like, I don't even know what you're talking about, which is a good thing. That's a wine expert. So I'm here, you're not gonna benefit, I mean, you're gonna benefit from abstaining from alcohol in this season of life, I promise. Friends, listen to me. I haven't drank a sip of alcohol in 20 years and I haven't missed a day of it, I promise you. I haven't missed a day of it. So here's what I wanna finish with. I want you to ask the Lord, not me. I don't want you to feel conviction from me. I don't want you to, I don't want you to say, this is where I'll be. I want you to ask the Lord, what does the Lord think about your life? And I want you to ask the Lord this, do you have a problem with alcohol? And if you were to admit today, I have a problem with alcohol, I have a drinking problem and I need to get help. The best thing for you to do is tomorrow night at 6.45, show up here to CR and say, I'm here and I want someone to help me. And I promise you that would begin a journey that would change the course of the rest of your life. We had an amazing CR this week, by the way. Uh, there was 400, I guess, people there, maybe more. Uh, it was unbelievable. Anybody showed up Monday night? Anybody was there? It was unbelievable. And it just showed me that the very things we hide in church today, we're so ashamed of, people in that room, including myself, have shared them and have experienced freedom through sobriety from addiction. And it's, amen? Like, so the first step is to go say, hey, I don't have it all figured out, but I need help. Maybe for you, it's an outpatient treatment. Maybe for you, it's rehab. Danny Spano, our team can definitely help you in that journey. Number two. Maybe you're, you're saying, hey, you really struck a chord today, Pastor. You talked about how maybe I'm suppressing or masking deeper issues in my life with a drinking problem. For you, I wanna encourage you to go talk to someone at the Next Steps area, talk to a counselor to get help. I wanna speak to the person who has a friend for a moment who, who drinks way too much and you know it and they don't agree with it. If you have a friend who has a drink of a problem, I wanna encourage you to have the courage and love for them enough to go talk to them, to share with them out of love that they need to get help. And if you're the person, listen to me, if you're watching, if you're the person on the receiving end of that conversation, you need to respect your friend enough to know that they loved you enough to come tell you the truth and not to let you keep destroying your life in that way. Friends, I know in a group this size, there are some like me years ago who would say, man, I'm struggling with, with something in my life. And again, take out alcohol and whatever the blank is that you fill in, whatever it is that is a stronghold in your life, I believe that, Je listen to me, Jesus does not want you to live bound any longer. I believe that. And I believe the Bible says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. For those, you do not have to live shackled to sin any longer. So I'm gonna ask you in just a moment to come here and you're gonna kneel down or stand up and I'm gonna pray over you a prayer of setting you free, asking the Lord, just like he did for me, to set you free from whatever is, whatever is binding you up, whatever has bound you up in just a moment. So I wanna pray over you with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just sit for just a moment and I just wanna ask you to do business with God. Say, God, is there something in my life that is, that is hindering me? Am I bound by something in my life? I don't know what it is, maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's a pill addiction. Maybe it's pornography. Whatever it is in your life that's, that you feel like you cannot break free from. It's the thing that you promise one night to never do and only to feel like you're back in it the next day and it's this recurring cycle. And I'm here to tell you, without Jesus, you will never experience sobriety. You never experience victory without Christ. And so if that's you right now, you don't have to tell me what it is. In fact, I just want you to acknowledge it before God. And if that's you, you don't have to share it out loud. I just want you to acknowledge it before God. Would you just right where you are, slip your hand up, say, Pastor Robbie, that's me. You don't have to share it. Just say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Just raise your hand high. Hey, that's me. Thank you, brother, sister. People all over. Pastor, pray for me. Thank you in the back. Anyone else? The balcony, praise God. If you're at home, praise God. Just say, Pastor, that's me. 
It was our dad who would say, I'm done with it once and for all. Stick it up high so I can acknowledge you before God. Praise God. Thank you, brother. Anyone else? Anyone else? Praise God. Thank you, brother in the back. Father, I pray right now for these men and women who have responded to say basically, I want you, Jesus, in my life to set me free. God, we can't, we can't unhook the shackles that we are chained to. We can't unbind ourselves from the bondage that we're in. We need someone outside of ourselves, the one who created us and knows us, the one who made us and formed us by his own hands, the one who gives us his spirit, who trusts us and and trust us to do great things for him. God, we can never be all that you've called us to be and be consumed with sin. And we admit, God, we can't set ourselves free. And so I'm praying right now by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would set men and women free today once and for all, that the bondage in their life would be removed like a backpack of weight and they'd walk out here with a lightness in their step. God, there'd be a new creation in you. You'd wipe away every tear from their eyes. Be no more guilt and shame, no more death, no more pain for the old order of things that passed away. Behold, you make all things new today. Give us a new song in our heart to sing. We ask it today in the only name we know how. And that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen.